Hello, Facebook, and welcome to our first Gen I Live panel. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about human trafficking in Indian country um, and what that means for um, not only uh, the impact for Native people, but also what human trafficking, trafficking does more broadly, um, the impact that it has. And so we have a great panel today. Um, we have Sarah Patowski from the National Congress of American Indians, and we have Lucy Martinez from the Department of Homeland Security's Blue Campaign. Um, and so we'll be having a short discussion about um, some of the work that we do and also just to talk through some of the issues. Um, but I will say that please submit your questions um, to the panel in the comment box below, um, and we'll be able to answer some of your questions towards the end of um, our panel. So you guys introduce yourselves, please. Sure. Hi, I'm Lucy Martinez, and I am with the DHS Blue Campaign. I am an, an external engagement advisor, and I've been with the Blue Campaign for um, well, since uh, October of last year. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Patalski. I serve as the Policy Research and Evaluation Manager for the National Congress of American Indians. I've been there for about three years now. Happy to be here. Great, thank you guys so much for being here. It's um, been quite an adventure putting this together and um, it's our first Gen I Live panel, so it should be a really great conversation. So, uh, Lucy, it's estimated that almost 21 million people are victims of human trafficking globally. Um, so with so many people being affected, why is human trafficking so overlooked? And why is it such a difficult topic for people to talk about? Well, Teddy, I, I do agree with you that is, it is a difficult topic for people to talk about. And I think part of it has to do with the fact that not many people understand it, and not many people, especially in this country, not many people know it's happening right here. However, um, in recent years, a lot of legislation has passed, especially here in the United States, starting with the, in the year 2000 with the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are putting a lot more effort into not only learning about this issue, but also trying to find solutions to prevent it and eliminate it completely. So I, I know a lot of um, states, um, they are taking big steps into ensuring that their law enforcement officers are trained in how to handle human trafficking victims as well as the cases and, and, the, and the traffickers themselves. Mm -hmm. um, the public sector has taken a big step into um, educating their, their own people as well as trying to um, bring awareness to the general public. Yeah. Despite all that, um, human traffic is, trafficking continues to be a, a hidden crime. So. Um, it's important, and one of the reasons is because a lot of the victims, um, they, they don't know, they don't seek help necessarily because they are afraid, sometimes afraid of their traffickers, mm -hmm. sometimes uh, they think that they are doing something wrong, uh, and sometimes even afraid of law enforcement. So that's why it's important for, in order to start the conversation, it's important for the victims to understand mm -hmm. that they are victims, that they can come forward with the problem with the, with their, with the crime and, and tell people what's going on. That way they can be helped and we can put those traffickers, you know, in jail. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And it's, it's interesting. Um, I had a conversation a couple months ago with, um, judge Toko Sarita from New York city who runs the, um, it's like a human trafficking court to try to mm. get, um, women who have been trafficked into po prostitution help. Yeah. Um, so if they've been, um, picked up on the streets, they go to this court and they have a decision whether they choose to get help and they can graduate. It's kind of like the drug court model. Okay. Um, and so it's really awesome to hear That's great. Uh, yeah. some of the work that you've yeah, been yeah. working on and why it, why it's so important no, yeah. um, that this is discussed. Yes. Um, how we at the Center for Native American Youth, we obviously work with Native youth issues. Um, it's super important to us, but how how does this topic, how does human trafficking impact youth specifically, and what data might we have to back that up? And I don't, I don't know if there's any native youth-specific data that we have, um, but maybe more broadly, what, how it impacts youth. Do you want to? Sure, sure. sure. Uh, I'll go ahead and take a stab at that. Um, I think, you know, when we talk about human trafficking and specifically sex trafficking, we, mm -hmm. we, the data 
on labor trafficking is still a little mm -hmm. bit um, mm -hmm. unclear, and particularly how it affects uh, parts of, of Indian country and Native Americans broadly. But within sex trafficking, this can really be understood within a broader context of historical trauma and atrocities that have been committed against yeah. Native American people from removal, the subjugation of, of Native women in particular. Um, but in the case of Native youth, um, you take that background of historical trauma, this uh, context of oppression, uh, and, and we see that there are many um, signs, vulnerabilities, I believe is they're mm -hmm. called, or risk yeah. factors, yes. however you want to see, uh, between trauma, poverty, being exposed to violence, um, precursors around substance abuse and addiction, um, greater, higher rates of involvement in the child welfare foster system, yeah. which we can see very clearly in mm -hmm. the data, um, a great overrepresentation, and that's a broader historic legacy as well, yeah. since the 60s and 70s, just the removal of Indian children from their homes. And very often, uh, well, not very often, but you, there are uh, cases where runaways will end up on the streets. There's higher rates of homelessness that we've mm -hmm. been able to document and see even um, in limited numbers and, and not even getting the full scope of it. But what we see is, is really stark. Um, great overrepresentation of, of Native youth in um, homeless populations. And so that creates a very vulnerable and um, risky situation for Native youth to be able to be picked up. Um, by traffickers and then um, sold into what is what is modern day slavery um, yeah. In, yeah. into um, as as in prostitution um, kept in captivity and and uh, held uh, ad addicted to drugs in many mm -hmm. cases there are very strong linkages between substance abuse and uh, opioid addiction interestingly yeah. and um, and trafficking and so um, what we have seen from the, the research is limited, and uh, Senator Tester was in fact very much keen on developing more research and getting more data points specifically for Native American populations in this area. And so he put in a request with the Government Accountability Office back in late 2015. They reached out to us and asked us to help them with compiling some of the existing research on Native populations and their involvement, Native youth, women, and mm -hmm. boys, also transgender persons uh, in the trafficking trade. Yeah. What is largely available is prostitution data, yeah. mm -hmm. and we see high overrepresentation in that as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and when they interview uh, former prostitutes, victims of this of trafficking, um, all of the vast majority, over 90% of them, will say this was done as an act of coercion mm -hmm. upon them. This was yeah. not a choice of theirs mm -hmm. to be engaged in this activity. Yeah. So that, by definition, is trafficking. And just helping people understand mm -hmm. that um, that's that's exactly uh, what trafficking is. So you know, some people have issues with looking at prostitution data as an indication of yeah. the, the rates mm -hmm. of trafficking, but um, it really is a, a helpful guide yeah. for us at least to start to know. And there are, uh, recently, we've been in contact with researchers in the Southwest. At Arizona State University, there's mm -hmm. actually a school for trafficking intervention research, and they've been conducting some phenomenal work in partnership with Amber Alert uh, to compile more data, working with victims who've been uh, rescued from mm -hmm. trafficking in sharing their experiences and yeah. their encounters, their health needs, their service point um, mm -hmm. touch points, where they were able to um, come into contact with people to support them and, and help them escape um, that very dire situation. Yeah. I'm wondering, um, how has this like age of technology, age of social media really helped boost the topic of human trafficking into, I mean, we're on Facebook Live right now talking about this, and, you know, it's, it's such, as we were talking about, it's such a hard topic to talk about. But now, I mean, something that we're in D.C., something that comes to mind is um, the, the D.C. police have now been using Twitter to um, blast out information about missing children, and so mm -hmm. there's been a lot of news behind that about, wow, how, how come there are so many missing youth and missing uh, women of color coming out of DC and I you know it's one of the it's very much a, a data issue and very much you know how do we get the information out um, mm -hmm. yeah. to our constituencies um, so we talked you talked a little bit about how this affects youth and you mentioned women and something that I found in one of your reports is that 
human trafficking disproportionately affects Native women. And why is that? Is there, you know, you talked about some of the risk factors, mm -hmm. but is there anything else behind that um, that's driving that? I think broadly we see higher rates of violence against women in yeah. Native communities. Yeah. That was a huge effort um, several years back around the time of the reauthorization, trying to highlight what we know in the data that um, women, Native women in particular, are victimized at much higher rates. Again, I think it is linked to this historical legacy of just the yeah. oppression of, of Native women, um, the hypersexualization, however you want to describe it. Um, but and that 70 to 80 percent of the offenders are non-native mm -hmm. um, people that are not necessarily from the community mm -hmm. yeah. and then that there are jurisdictional barriers mm -hmm. this is really at the crux here that tribes in very in many cases do not have are not um, legally empowered because of this decision mm -hmm. Oliphant v. Suquamish back yeah. in 78, to be able to have legal recourse against non-Indian mm -hmm. offenders on tribal lands. And yeah. so it's, these crimes go, occur with impunity. And with that VAWA reauthorization, we were able to push for limited, very limited um, tribal uh, um, authority to prosecute crimes of intimate partner violence. However, that really critically needs to be expanded to include um, victims that are children and other types of crimes so that tribes can actually begin to rein in um, these activities on their lands. Three affiliated tribes out in North Dakota have been super vigilant on this. They have passed a code to f combat trafficking on their lands. They've seen a huge uptick in victimization that has resulted from the influx of young um, very often male workers coming in to work on the oil fields and the Bakken fields. And these are people that are not from the community, and there is just a, a lot of money and, and a lot of, um, not a lot, to, you know, um, there's just a, been a huge spike in, in drugs being trafficked and also people being trafficked, a lot of Native women and children um, from within the communities and elsewhere. Um, and so it's been very uh, I, I want to applaud them for the very critical work that yeah. they've been doing to begin to exert tribal sovereignty in this area and try to really um, curb these yeah. these crimes occurring on their lands. But that, yeah. that jurisdictional piece mm -hmm. is critical. Hmm. Lucy, one of the things that the Blue Campaign does is they train people on how, I think, they train people on how to identify um, yes. people who are victims of human trafficking. and. I think it's super important for people, and especially for mm -hmm. our viewers, to, to know how to identify. What are some of, some of those signs that people should look for when identifying human trafficking victims? Well, I, identifying a victim is, is the first step mm -hmm. into, um, into probably not, not only helping a victim, but also maybe even saving a life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to uh, send everyone to go to the Blue Campaign website and to go to the indicator page and go through the list of indicators. I'm going to go through a few of them, but there is a long list of indicators. And depending on, on what type of um, location or, or if it's a native youth or if it's, uh, you're in an airplane or mm -hmm. if you are uh, in, 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 uh, on, the, on the train, it can, it can, it, the indicators vary based on where you are and what you're doing. So it is important to know your your environment so that you can recognize what is happening. Yeah. Um, I'm going to show you uh, one of our little tools that we have is, I have it right here. I think I lost it. Oh, it's right here. <laughs> it's uh, an indicator card. And people can take this. They can um, get it from the Blue Campaign. You can print it out. And it comes in, uh, I have it here in Spanish and English. And people can print it and take it with them so that they can know the, the basic indicators of human trafficking. Mm -hmm. And this will help people um, know what they should be looking for. Yeah. So um, human trafficking victims, like I said, come in, ver in various, I guess, forms, to, for lack of a better word. Um, but if a person seems to be either disconnected or, or they, they don't seem to be themselves anymore, if it's someone you knew and, and now they are not as bubbly or, or as nor as the way they used to be, that could be an indicator of human trafficking. They, if you see them um, with um, bruises or, or mm -hmm. being hurt or, or they're not as healthy as they used to look, 
um, that could also be another sign of human trafficking. Um, for youth, if they uh, stopped attending school or if the youth comes to school with maybe a um, brand new iPhone or all these new yes, things yeah. that they didn't have before and it's not like their parents changed their economic mm -hmm. status. So those are little ways that you can recognize um, human trafficking. Yeah. And a lot of times, um, like I said, they're not, they, the, the victims do not know that they're being human trafficked. Mm -hmm. So if someone else brings that to their attention, you can be saving a life. So yeah. it is important to know these this, um, this indicators and signs. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And I know how important it is to know those indicators. I have a mentor who was going through an airport mm -hmm. and she had gone through this training about how to identify human trafficking victims mm -hmm. and she spotted a bunch of um, a bunch of the signs in this woman and mm. this man that she was with um, and brought it to the attention of some of the security people and it turns out that she had been picked up somewhere um, and was being trafficked and they were traveling I'm not sure where but it yeah. really is important to know those signs. No, it is. Yeah. And so I would definitely, I'm definitely going to go through those indicators, and I would urge our audience to yes. definitely go to the Blue Campaign website and visit some of their, those resources. I think just another critical point just related to this issue is that um, major sporting events also yes. tend yes. to be a yes. huge point. So the mm -hmm. Super Bowl is one. You can see some resources. They do annual reports at that school that I mentioned in ASU, yeah. Arizona State University, on the uptick and just general rates of, of trafficked persons that they've found in these Super Bowl venues. But mm -hmm. also tribes are really trying to lead the way in training up their law enforcement mm -hmm. and also in, in, in settings like casinos. Tribal casinos yeah. are, are another place where they're training employees to recognize um, potential victims as well. Yep. Awesome. Um, I think at that, talking about the Super Bowl, we actually had an audience question um, next year's Super Bowl is happening in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Right. Minneapolis has a very high concentration of, uh, it's a very high native population. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can talk about this or maybe you can talk about some of the things that are typically done to curb um, some of those, the human trafficking that goes on in those communities during events like the Super Bowl. Well, um, speaking for DHS, mm -hmm. I know um, we do a lot of preparation and uh, we bring a lot of our resources to the, the cities uh, when there are major events happening. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, we partner with the local law enforcement and we bring in um, our HSI agents and also uh, other agents and we form Viper teams and I'm not gonna remember the acronym of Viper right now, but <laughs> <laughs> you can look it up. It's uh, Viper teams are composed of various uh, law enforcement entities and they come together mm -hmm. to, to do assessments and to, and to make sure that criminal activities are not taking place and to prevent anything that can be happening during those uh, major events. So he, uh, DHS play, plays a big role in making sure that yeah. we are present <clears throat> and that people know that we are watching and that if people see something, they're gonna say something. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, we had another audience question. One of the youth we work with, one of our champions, um, Nancy Deer Turney had um, submitted a question. She lives in a community where this highway passes through um, and it's known for um, a corridor, a human trafficking corridor, essentially. Um, and so this has become one of her passions to have the community come together and discuss this. How do mm. they help curb this? And so her question was, we talked in the beginning about how this is such a hard topic to discuss, mm -hmm. but how do you engage your community members when it is such a difficult topic to discuss? How do you bring them together when, you know, I've heard it, you know, why do we need to talk about this? You know, it's the same thing with suicide. It's such a difficult topic yeah, to talk about. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, well, oh, you can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had a very similar conversation when we broached the whole issue about vi around violence against Native women. Yeah. A lot of people didn't want to see it in their own backyards, didn't want to acknowledge it, and didn't want to have to face the consequences of what does this mean now going forward and how can we own up to situations where there may be violence in our own families. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, we were able to work through that in much 
thanks to the strong women that came yeah. forward and were leaders. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what we're seeing is that the victims themselves who are, have now escaped and are free from this slavery are, are the ones that are the most powerful yeah. advocates and, and proponents of, of affecting change. And I think um, one way to start is to really focus on the prevention. Yeah. Um, and that really is about supporting safe and healthy and violent free families, um, really supporting the family structure in community so that those risk factors aren't there and that you, you can prevent, you know, save a life from even entering yeah. Um, yeah. that situation. And then, of course, there, there can be further conversations about um, the, the following steps about passing safe harbor laws so that you're ensuring victims are finding safety and aren't criminalized when yeah. they are mm -hmm. That's um, important. brought out and, and other yep. important so one last audience question before I, I wrap things up um, from our old staff member, Ryan Ward. Um, he asked, are there any examples of tribes successfully addressing human trafficking? If so, what have they done? Sarah. <laughs> so as part of this resource brief that we pulled together with the GAO and, and for the Senate mm -hmm. Committee on Indian Affairs, we highlighted several tribal best practices um, and, and several codes that many tribes have passed in order to directly target mm -hmm. these issues. Um, again, we mentioned how tribes are training their members and employees to recognize the signs. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, one thing I have yet to see, but I did want to get back to the point about technology, yeah. um, is that technology is both a blessing and a curse in this domain yeah. because it's part of the problem that allows people to be victimized in the yeah. first place. That's the, that's the area, the gray area, where the traffickers are very mm. often operating. Mm -hmm. yes. You know about sites like Backdoor yeah. and so mm -hmm. on that are, yeah. that are huge. And, um, but at the same time, technology can be used to help identify and get people out. There was an yeah. app developed called Red, uh, Red Light Traffic, and that's one where you can report signs. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a lot of tech companies that are now becoming more involved in, in supporting uh, the identification of where trafficking is occurring. And so there are um, yes. really critical touch points there. But as far as, um, I don't know if any tribes have developed that yet. It would be neat yeah. to see. Um, but certainly as far as legal recourse, trying to expand their jurisdictional authority, um, tribes have passed safe harbor laws. Um, some tribal researchers who have been doing work in this domain for 20 plus years have recommended that tribes um, do the cultural uh, reintegration yeah. and welcome home mm -hmm. ceremonies for former victims. Wow. Oh, wow. And, and yeah. really, because once you have that culture identity back, I mean, the yes. whole trafficking experience strips you yeah, of your absolutely. identity. Mm -hmm. So those are some really important ways that tribes yeah. are, um, have great. been engaging in this area. That's great. Yeah. Great. Um, just to wrap things up, I do want to give time um, for you both to talk about resources um, yeah. that organizations might have. Um, you talked about the cards, the identif identifier cards, um, but I know that there are more and other resources that are available. Um, I know that you guys have this task force and the, or the report that you have um, that you're, you guys are working on now too. So, um, Well, yeah, the Blue Campaign we have, um, if you go to the Blue Campaign website, which is uh, dhs.gov backslash blue campaign, uh, there is a tab full of resources. People can print posters and get the indicator cards and distribute them in your in your communities and definitely raise awareness within your own area. Also, uh, it's important to know once you once you see something that you don't think um, it's it's normal or it can, or it's, you know brings those indicators that you are going to memorize. That uh, once you see them, you can. Contact, it's important to know the, the numbers that you need to contact. First, I'm going to give you the human trafficking um, hotline. And the human, tra human trafficking hotline, it's 1-866-347-2423. And there's also the ICE, sorry, that was the ICE tip line. And the national human trafficking hotline is 1-888-373-7888. So first, I give you the ICE tip line, uh, which is out for our HSI agents, and you can uh, report any tips directly to law enforcement. The National Human Trafficking Hotline, it's also an amazing uh, resource for people to contact. And um, if you have any doubts or you don't think, or you feel kind of 
we are calling um, law enforcement, which is totally fine, then call the National um, Human Trafficking Hotline and they can definitely um, help you and help probably a victim. And for my part within the National Congress of American Indians, I'll first speak to some of the research and, and data. I did reference this report that we pulled together, uh, Human and Sex Trafficking, Trends and Responses Across Indian Country. This was released in the spring of last year. Um, we're constantly looking for ways to update it and improve it. Uh, at our upcoming Tribal Leaders Scholar Forum, which is taking place in Connecticut this June, we will be featuring a session that has uh, new research and data with focus groups of former trafficking victims that will be featured. Uh, just some more information and, and resources that way about how do we go about collecting data, really wrapping our heads around the scope of this challenge, specifically in Indian country. And then uh, because our, the National Congress of American Indian is heavily involved in legislative activity, uh, I would like to alert everyone to the reauthorization, ongoing reauthorization of the victims of trafficking Act that's ongoing. Currently, uh, the, you know, the Senate passed it late last year. With uh, it was unanimous, but it it has a five million dollars currently in it, and there is an effort now to boost that amount to fifty five million dollars, and so and to try to slate aside a, a, a amount that would be specifically for tribal victims, recognizing the their unique needs and. Um, the higher proportion of, of victimization there. And so we're very active in tracking that legislation and supporting its advance. So, Great. Well, thank you guys so much. I want to repeat that um, human trafficking hotline one more time. It's 1-888-373-7888. Um, so thank, thank you. you guys again for coming and for thank participating you. in our first in our live panel. Uh, please make sure to look for um, an announcement for our next Gen I Live panel, which will happen next month. Um, and thank you, Facebook Live.